Several weeks before D-Day, the Germans received several high-tech interesting vehicles to defend from an upcoming invasion. Yes, Goliaths. These RC Wunderwaffen were intended to be used on the beaches and would have done immense damage to an upcoming landing craft. But this never happened and dozens of these tracked mines were found by the allies behind the beaches. So what happened? Why weren't they used? Let's find out in this video. The Goliath or Leiter Ladungstrager, meaning light charge carrier, called Doodlebug by the Allies, was developed in 1940, after the Germans recovered a prototype from the Seine River in Paris. This prototype was made by, and I'm going to butcher the name here, Adolphe Kegresse. This prototype was based on a remote control vehicle named the Wickerham Land Torpedo, developed in 1916, during the First World War, to cross no man's land and attack the trenches of the enemy. During the 1930s, the British and the Americans would develop several remote controlled vehicles, thinking this would lead to remote controlled tanks in the near future. But these vehicles were clunky and unreliable at best, and in the end nothing really came from it. But in the 1940s the Germans saw some value in these vehicles and the German company Borgwatt would develop a similar vehicle which could carry a 50 to 60 kilogram charge and this would eventually be the SDKFC 302. The 302 was an electric powered vehicle which was steered remotely via cable connected to a control box which would have a triple strand cable attached to the rear of the vehicle. This cable could reach 650 meters. The cable was used both for control and for transmitting power to the electric drive system. But the 302 proved to be extremely fragile and the electric engine would break with even the slightest touch or movement. So the production went over to the newly developed petrol engine powered 303A and the later developed 303B. So one thing I have noticed about these vehicles is the extreme amount of different ways these vehicles were produced. From bolted side panels to metal pressed side panels to different road wheels and there are some mystery Goliaths out there like this one at Kabinka. But some sources say this one is fake and the box on top was made post war. Another interesting one can be found in the Wroclaw Museum in Poland which is claimed to be a Goliath 303B. There's also a 336 version, but I can't seem to find little to no information on this one. So if you have any information on these vehicles, let me know in the comments below. Goliaths were used in all fronts and would see action at Anzio and the Warsaw Uprising. They were successfully used against the 509 Parachute Infantry Battalion at the Maritime Alps in France. But they proved to be extremely unreliable at best, meaning that a mere truck ride to a location could make them unusable. This made fast deployment out of the question. They would also get stuck or the remote wire would break. And even with the upgraded 303A and B, they would need frequent maintenance to keep them even serviceable. This was of course because they were disposable vehicles, made to be disposed and blown up. Meaning that they were made like cheap Chinese remote cars. That's probably why they weren't popular with engineer units and would be abandoned on most cases. The Allies found several of these all over Germany, like here in Bamberg. This pile of Goliaths was discovered on 14th of April 1945. It said that from the 7000 produced, over 80% were dumped and never used. The Allies never saw any military value in them, but in the later years they proved to lay the foundation for the post-war advances in remote control vehicle technology. In 1944, a few weeks prior to the D-Day landings, the Goliath would have been deployed along the coast of Normandy. After the battle, it was found around Gold and Sword Beach by the British and Canadians. A lot weren't even used and would have been found behind the beaches, abandoned. After looking around for information, it wasn't really known to me if they got any of the preparations ready for these machines 
on the British section alone. And most of the pictures I found were from Goliaths that were sitting in a field somewhere. But I did find this sole picture, showing a Canadian soldier looking at a Goliath. This one is set up in one of their protective enclosures, ready to roll out. It seems to have some wood panels on the ground to make it easy to drive out of its position, and this would mean that some were set up and ready to go. Demonstration of the Nazi midget demolition tank captured both in Italy and in France. Loaded with explosives, the tiny tank can be sent against selected targets by radio control. This device appears to be expendable. A larger type can be retrieved by radio after discharging its load of explosives. The American troops also found them on Omaha Beach. You can see American troops in this newsreel testing them and having a lot of fun actually playing with them. But if they were actually used in battle and set up in the defenses is unknown to me. And after doing some research it seems there isn't much information on these vehicles at Omaha Beach. But the Americans did archive a lot of information on these vehicles at the Utah sector. So I'm going to focus on Utah Beach for now. The defense of Utah would consist out of several types of bunkers and machine gun nests. The big defensive positions were several bunkers along the coast that had the 5cm KWK L60 pack guns, like WN30, 11, 08 and 05. Other locations like the STP-09 were defended by an 88mm, several Tobruks with tank turrets, and mortar bunkers. The battle for this position was filmed and you can see the STP-09 bunker burning in this famous footage. The guns at WN-05 weren't as heavily protected and were only placed on open top ring stands. But what they did have in this location were several Goliaths. The Goliaths were to be deployed from small underground positions along the beach, like here at the WN-05 strong point. These vehicles would have been controlled by one command bunker, which would have one control box attached to several of these vehicles, which of course would have had its own control line. One of these locations would have been here where the engineer's memorial is now, just behind one of the surviving 5cm guns. But during the landings these goliaths failed when the allied bombardments severed the wire control lines, leading to the command bunker. So in the book Invasion They're Coming by Paul Geralt, I found the following section, which states the eyewitness accounts of Lieutenant Janke, who was the commander of the section of WN05. Lieutenant Janke ordered the Goliaths to be employed. The dwarf tanks rumbled off, the men at the remote control boxes tried to guide them forward to enemy armor. But the steering did not work. The delicate relays had been damaged by the concussion of aerial and naval bombardment. Not a single one could be brought near its target. They remained lying on the foreshore, even so one of them was yet to claim an appalling toll of blood. Janka also accounts that shortly after the Goliath's failure, assault teams start to blow the tank wall. And when a shell landed next to his trench, he went unconscious for a moment. The next thing he felt was somebody pulling at his feet. Suffering from concussion and covered in sand, he found it was an American that had saved him. Instinct from fighting on the Russian front told him to defend himself at all costs. He felt for his submachine gun but an American kicked it out of his way. They helped him up and gave him a cigarette. He was taken prisoner and was taken to England as POW that evening. So now we can make out that they were used and sort of worked at WN05, but failed because of bomb damage, got stuck or weren't working at all. This was probably the reason why they weren't used on OMA. They simply did not really work great on rough terrain and they could not be deployed on every beach. OMA had a lot of high cliffs and there weren't a lot of spots they could have been deployed. The cobbles and stones on some of the beaches proved to be a problem for the Goliath which would get stuck or the line would snap. In other cases the preparations weren't ready 
or the German command did not find them helpful at all. The conditions on Utah Beach were much more favorable, with low sandy dunes and nice sandy beaches, which worked a lot better and this is why they were deployed onto spots alone at WN05. But the inferior control lines were still a problem and the fact the Germans had these vehicles to be controlled by one control bunker is in my personal opinion a bad decision. Because if the control line to the command bunker gets hit, the entire thing is out of action. I would have been much more effective if they had them be controlled by a dream man group for each Goliath, but this was probably impossible because of manpower. The Goliath weren't the Wunderwaffen the Germans hoped for and were pretty useless in my opinion. Like most German equipment they are still being upheld by propaganda today as seen as one of the great German weapons of its time. But RC technology came a lot further in the 1950s in modern military technology, drones and also in the toy and model industry. Like Tamiya which revolutionized the RC model kit industry and who let us normal plebs have fun with RC cars for more than 60 years now, just like the soldiers on that beach that day. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. I had a lot of trouble finding information for this subject and it took me more than a month to finally finish it. If you want to support my videos buy me a coffee to keep me awake in these nights of editing these videos. Next weekend I will be heading back to Oma and I'm going to have a look at the Oma Beach Museum. So I will see you next weekend, have an awesome day.